All right. So I am Ben Brown, owner of BSL Nutrition, and uh, I'd like to officially welcome Dr. Garrett Smith. And uh, Dr. Garrett, how you doing? I'm doing great today. Dr. Garrett and I have known each other. Well, I've known of Dr. Garrett for quite some time, but we've kind of known each other probably for the last eight or 10 years. And um, I don't know if you remember this or not, but it must have been about 2008 or 2009. And I was, I had just um, kind of opened up a little office in your brother-in-law's physical therapy clinic. Yes. And I was um, personal training, but I was also really trying to get into nutrition coaching. And I was doing functional medicine. I had been studying for a whole like six months or a year. I'd been studying functional medicine and I was running uh, adrenal tests and, and gut health tests. And um, I was really trying to, trying to get into that realm of, of helping as many people as I could with, with really diagnostic nutrition and clinical nutrition. And I'd been studying that for quite some time, the clinical nutrition aspect. And it, it, I had, um, I had gone out um, to network with some local naturopaths and one specific guy I went in and met with him. He's a big, a big naturopath in Scottsdale here. And he, we were talking and, and he found out that I was doing some functional medicine testing, he found out I was doing some adrenal testing and he tore into me, tore into me. And it, it was really, uh, I don't know, it was humbling for me. It was very discouraging. Um, I was angry and I kind of, um, I remember coming out of his clinic and sitting in my car and just being like, dude, I feel awful. Like all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help more people. I'm trying to learn more, you know, I'm trying to help people in a way that's not just like, let's beat them up in the gym. How can I really help people? And, and um, so it was a very discouraging time at that point in my career. And, and I had, um, I had talked with your brother-in-law and he said, you know, you should contact um, Garrett in Tucson. He's a naturopath. And I remember calling you up and um, we actually had a great conversation and you weren't judgmental at all. And you were like, dude, you know, I fully respect what you're trying to do. You know, you're trying to help more people. It's important to stay within the context of your practice, but you know, the fact that it, assuming you understand what you're doing and, and the premise behind it, and you're not just throwing supplements at them. And so I have a very strong appreciation for that mentality that, that you had at the time. And, and so I don't, I don't think I brought that up to you at any point since, but um, I appreciate that. And with that said, uh, it's nice to know I wasn't a jerk in the past, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. So anyways, that's, that's how we first were introduced. And, and now Dr. Garrett, obviously you're in Tucson and you're a naturopathic doctor. Why don't you tell, tell us a little bit more about what you're up to? Okay. Well, what I'm up to nowadays kind of my, so I went through the functional medicine stuff that you're talking about. Gosh, I had phases, you know, I went through the adrenal fatigue phase. I actually worked for the guy who wrote the book on adrenal fatigue. I went through the candida phase. I went through the toxic metal phase. I went through probably some other phases too. And I was always looking for something that was going to be the, the least amount of testing that would give me the most amount of information and get to the root of things the most. So I'm, I'm kind of become a specialist in hair mineral analysis because, well, obviously, if you remember in high school, you know, the, the periodic table, the elements, that's what we're made of, right? So I kind of, after realizing that this was a good way of measuring it, I kind of got into that. I dove in, I reverse engineered how people had been prescribing supplements because kind of like the, the turf war that you ran into with that ND, there's kind of a thing in the hair mineral analysis world where they don't share always why they do certain things. Mm -hmm. So I had to go and look at the patterns of what they were giving people and what they were doing to people to figure out how that tied to the hair analysis and, and why you do certain things when and why you wouldn't do certain things. And it helped my health. I'm kind of, you know, some might call a little obsessive in testing my hair. I have a great hairdo for hair analysis. Yeah. So I do my own testing every, about every five, five, six weeks because I can just cut off all my hair. <laughs> it makes it really easy. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my main thing. I have a little practice down here in Tucson and it's just, it's just me, but we've got an international clientele just got my first professional athlete. I have a lot of really athletic 
people who kind of, I joke that they exercise for a living. Um, and uh, that's, I'm just trying to do the most I can for people in the, the least investment that they can and with the least, you know, obviously if people want to get healthy, they have to change what they're doing, but with the least impact into their, what they've found to be their normal life. Yeah. Cool. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what is hair mineral analysis? Um, how is it relevant? Like, why would we look at, why would we look at hair? What's, what's the mechanism there? Um, as com and especially as compared to some of the other diagnostic tests that we would run, like how can we extrapolate the most amount or, or useful data from that? Okay, well, so blood is what most people are familiar with, obviously. That's, that's the one that you go into the doctor and they tend to do. And I'm not against blood tests at all. I don't ever want to think that. I'm, I, I actually have people send me any tests they've had done within the last year or anything they have relevant because once we have the hair mineral analysis, it can give me more insight into those other tests and those other tests can give me more insight into the hair analysis. So anyway, the hair, so why don't I go to blood first line? Uh, the reason I don't go to blood first line is because very simply, I mean, even just dehydration can affect your blood values a ton. You remember that from probably what you learned in functional medicine, like you see RBC and the hematocrit and all that, and they go up and you go, well, they're obviously dehydrated. So that's just the simplest thing. I posted a, an article of mine where I looked into, I mean, there was time of day effect test there was hydration there was all sorts of things so when I started, to see that, I started to wonder you know how useful is this when I did the functional medicine kind of approach um, what I found was with the supplements they recommended I could change lab values and you may have seen this too we could change lab values but it didn't necessarily mean the person felt any better and I was to the point where I don't care if I change lab values if they're not getting better and usually they don't stay around if you have perfect lab values and they don't feel good they're not going to hang around. So, and then the blood test. This is the big thing about blood tests for nutrition. So when people get their metabolic panel and it's got calcium on it, and it's got sodium on it and potassium, and those are the three main minerals that it's got. Other, I mean, it's got chloride on it, but that's not really something too often. Um, the body works very hard to maintain those in a very tight range, right? And if they get outside of those ranges, they've got obvious symptoms. They've got problems. The body has lost control of that mineral. And what the hair test shows us as opposed to the blood test is it shows us when the trends in the blood. So if like, if there was a trend in the body of calcium kind of rising over time, I mean, the, the, the blood may still be stable. I have a study that showed that when they gave rats a 50% deficient magnesium diet, so they, half the magnesium of what these rats are supposed to get, six months after that diet, their magnesium level in the blood had not changed. Right. And so we go, well, is that useful for nutrition purposes? It's not telling us that for six months they have only been getting half of the magnesium. In. So in terms of those other blood minerals, it doesn't tell us if your body still has control, what the hair test shows us is the compensations made by the body over time, whether there's a trend in the blood towards generally having extra calcium in the blood and then it has to get rid of it, or if there's a trend there's not enough in the blood and it, it will hold it in. So look at the hair test as kind of a, I call it a surrogate for intracellular testing or also for looking at the trends in the blood over time. I've, an analogy I've used before is if the blood is like the roads, I'm pointing to the roads because there's a road right outside here. Um, the blood is like the roads and the, the, the hair test shows us what's going on inside the houses. And most people that most of your life, like the important parts in your life don't happen on the road when you're driving. They happen in the houses when you're with people. So that's in the cells is really where the action is. And that's what the hair test kind of gives us a, a hint. Or, you know, it gives us a good picture of, and it also tells us when the body's like really trying to get rid of a lot of a mineral, or it tells us if it's accumulated a lot of mineral, or if it's really trying to hold on to it. Like I see all the time on hair tests, like super low potassium. Yeah. And I know from people's diets that they don't get enough potassium. And I know from taking vitamin D supplements, however they take it in food or food or supplements, that will drop potassium. I have a study showing, you know, the kidneys lose a ton of potassium when they take vitamin D. So just those two things, you know, we try to fix both of them. And then we start over time, we start to see the potassium come up in the hair. So, so you found, and so you're suggesting that the blood is, it can be a good measure, but it, it may not be the best measure for it 
um, assessing nutrient imbalances, especially in the acute phase, right? Or, or even acute, like, you know, looking at multiple weeks at a time or even multiple months at a time is nothing's really going to show up. Our body does such a good job at maintaining homeostasis. Nothing's really going to show up until we're in trouble, basically. Yeah, yeah but by the time people's blood tests have gone out of line, that they've they are having obvious symptoms, as you know from from what you did. Um, but you can stay within those ranges and still be, you know, potassium will usually range on the blood test. Right. And when you don't even see it show up on the hair test, this is this is an important thing is that I like to use extremes and examples when I talk about these things. So the body has one of the cool things about the hair is like in a deficiency situation, is the body has no responsibility to put any mineral at all in the hair. And that's an important thing to know. And so we take that example to the extreme and we say, does the body even have to grow hair? <laughs> we see people every day where they don't have to grow hair, right? Nice. So it doesn't affect their health at all. But so like, does the body have to put any potassium in the hair? No. Does it have to keep the blood stable? Absolutely. Right. So what it can do is it can retain the potassium in the blood and not waste it into the hair. Just like if somebody wasn't making enough money, then they stop spending as much. So the body stops wasting the potassium into the hair, so it keeps in the blood, so it can keep the blood level stable. Now, what we know from a, like a low thing on a hair test is we know that either, either the diet is deficient or that the body's probably either losing or lost too much of something. Whereas when we see something really high on a hair test, what it means is there's a trend towards that mineral rising in the blood, so it could be from something like with calcium going up in the hair, vitamin D, it could be from taking tons of calcium supplements. It could be from actually bone loss, right? I mean, if, if, if you're losing calcium from bones, it has to go into the blood to leave. So if you were losing a ton of calcium from the bones, that could show up as high calcium. All we can know is that from, from a high calcium on a hair test or a high mineral on a hair test, we just know that it's been, it's been trending too high in the blood. And then we get to go into the detective work, which is, what, which is why I love doing this. I get to be like a nutrition detective. Yeah. And I get to go through the, the obvious questions that I figured out to this point of how did this happen? What have you been doing in the past that has led to this? Actually, that homeostasis term is actually important because I think that the body actually seems to reach a homeostasis in the hair where the hair test, if, if things are not done to specifically affect minerals, like if people just kind of keep doing what they're doing, the hair test can stay super steady over time. Yep. And the minerals may be really messed up in the hair, but the hair test just stays steady. So it's kind of like once, it, it, I don't know, it'd be like an injury that you never, injury you never rehab. It just, it's still there. It never just goes away. Um, and that's, that, so the hair test gives us an average of the, I call it the mineral movements Depending upon how long the hair you cut is, if people cut the full hair sample, which is like about one and a half to two inches, that's giving us like an insight into about three to six months of what's been moving in the hair. Mine is like, you know, mine's real time. Mine's like five weeks. All the hair that has grown since the last time I cut my hair is in the hair sample. So it's kind of cool that way. It's, it's given me a way of learning things a lot faster. Um, but anyway, that's, it's so much less expensive than the blood tests. I mean, if somebody were to just buy a hair test from my office, I mean, I think we charge a hundred dollars, like just the test itself. Right. Is and that's, that's what a couple blood tests, right? That's <laughs> depending on the blood test. You might not even get one blood test if you wanted like the calcitriol, which is an important one. So anyway, I could talk all day on here. So, tests, okay, cool. So no, that makes perfect sense. I think that, I think that's really logical in terms of, okay, how the body's pushing certain minerals in certain directions or, or through the hair. And, and so you're looking for, not only the presence of certain minerals in the hair, but you're also looking for um, certain ratios between the minerals. Is, is that right? Yeah, I'm looking, I mean, we look for mineral deficiencies, mineral excesses, and then mineral imbalances. Yeah, the ratios. So, go ahead. And then, and then based on that, and then based on obviously your experience, and then really starting to dig in, and, and you had said before that like you don't just – you specifically, you personally, like you haven't just subscribed to the model of like, okay, well, if calcium's high and potassium's low, it means we need to prescribe these specific supplements. You've tested enough people and you've really started to dive into the specific ratios and, and what it means, you know, to know 
how those specifics, like how and why those specific supplements are going to affect someone, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, so we look, at, we look at both the levels and the ratios, right? Because it takes two levels to make a ratio. So really, I, I liken it to if somebody was organizing a dance and you want, what your goal is for the dance, 50 men and 50 women, right? A one-to-one -one ratio, you want this 100 people. So amount of people is important and ratios are important. If you have one guy and one woman show up, you've got a great ratio, but you don't have enough of either. If you have 100 men and 100 women show up, great ratio, too many people, fire departments coming, fire marshals coming, kicking everybody out or whatever. So, but then also if you have 100 men and one woman and you've got fights, right? So <laughs> nice. we, want both the, we want the levels to be good. We want the ratios to be good. Usually what happens on a hair test is the body, as we do things correctly, the body will fix the ratios first and then the levels come down into line. There's, there's certain mineral pairs that really are attracted to each other or that really function with each other. Calcium to magnesium is a big pair. Sodium to potassium is a big pair. Copper to zinc is a big pair. And those like to try to move up and down together. So we, they tend to, try to like, so if one was up here and one's down here, they tend to try to join each other first before they move where we want. Sure. And so once you know the pattern that happens and once you know which, which minerals move last and what, and a big topic that I go into is what vitamin D supplements do in the body, and how long it takes to we'll get, get there. Yeah. Once, once I didn't want to go into that too much yet, but <laughs> I mean, it can take me when, as an example, when people have high calcium, like, I'm, I don't want anybody to think that this is a quick fix. When people have high calcium, and I'm working on that on their first hair test, it's going to take at least a year to fix that calcium. And, but the cool thing is, is I have people who, I had a guy a trigger finger, which is a big calcification thing. I never treated his trigger finger. I just fixed his calcium. He was a, he was a man with very high calcium. Men, when they get high calcium, they are, they are messed up. Right. His trigger finger is gone. There's no more trigger finger. And that was just a calcification and we just, we just fixed it. And that was so it, the body can dissolve the calcium in these places. I've had people where they say, I don't have a bone spur anymore. The trigger finger went away. Um, <laughs> a relative of mine passed a kidney stone within a month of being on the program because it was dissolving the kidney stone and it just broke off and uh, went out. So it's, it's fun. I mean, it's, we're really just getting the, I, the soup of the body we're trying to make the best suit <laughs> once we do that things fix themselves so so what would what are the typical symptoms that you see um and i'm, I'm assuming you see everything so i don't know if that's the best way to that that's the best question but but what are typically the things that you would see with specific mineral imbalances? Like what are the big three? Well, okay, so what are the big three mineral imbalances that you see? And, and what if there's any um, generalized symptoms associated? Okay, so, well, I'll just, I'm, I'm gonna go on a real big picture here. Thing. So, so calcium. I'm gonna go with high calcium because that's what I, that's 90% of my people. So high calcium, if you think of high calcium in the human body as like rust on a machine. Okay, rust on a machine just slows everything down. The machine still works, it's just slow. It doesn't work quite like it should. So high calcium, we tend to see slow down digestion, like especially kind of the hypochlorhydria stuff yeah. that we see. That's a slowdown in the stomach, we tend to see thyroid slowing down, mm -hmm. you know, low energy, brain fog, low body temperature, all that stuff. And then we tend to see blood sugar stuff. Um, calcium and, and blood sugar don't get along. So we tend to see the hypoglycemia stuff. Now, if we get into the ratios on calcium, calcium to phosphorus is more of that stomach acid one. Calcium to magnesium is more of the blood sugar one. Calcium to potassium is more of the thyroid one. And if you remember, I said vitamin D tends to raise calcium and lower potassium. We have a thyroid problem today, right? Absolutely. We have a vitamin D fad epidemic, right? Vitamin D raises calcium, lowers potassium. It raises that ratio. I'm going to say that the vitamin D fad and the thyroid epidemic are probably going together. And 
That's just, that's what it does in the minerals. So, and I don't want anyone to think I'm against vitamin D. I, I love the stuff the body makes. And I think having a, a naturally high level, a good level of vitamin D, not high, a good level of vitamin D is great. Using supplements to get there, I fix, I fix what that breaks every day. <laughs> well, but, you, just, you just said that there's other synergistic nutrients. So if, oh, gosh, we're, yeah. if we're deficient in other minerals, then it's, it's wasting our time to just keep pounding vitamin D supplements. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the, the vitamin D, if you go around the internet and you find the people who really love vitamin D, they will talk about how vitamin D, it, it should be more called hormone D that some people call it, you know. Think about what that implies in the strength of the vitamin D. They're saying it's not just a vitamin, it's a hormone. Hormones are the most powerful things in our body for better or worse. Note the worse. <laughs> I keep seeing articles by people saying, oh, you just can't take too much vitamin D. And I'm like, I have an article from the 60s, or it was the 50s when the vitamin D2 fad came in. Mm -hmm. And how people were doing the Viking protocol where they were drinking raw milk and taking cod liver oil and taking vitamin D2. And these two women went to the hospital for it. And their, cal their blood calcium levels, even when they took them off all that stuff, didn't come down for a year after that. So the vitamin D actually will store in the fat. And it can just cause terrible long-term things. It, the, the vitamin D supplements are very, very, very different from what the body does. And most people wouldn't go with hormones on their own without knowing what they're doing, yet everybody's just taking vitamin D or not realizing that, like magnesium and calcium. I have a study, the NHANES study, where they basically found that vitamin D levels correlated with magnesium levels. So the people with better magnesium levels had, had better vitamin D, and the people with lower magnesium levels had lower vitamin D. So what does that mean? It means that a magnesium deficiency will cause a vitamin D deficiency, but people go to their doctor, they get tested, you have low vitamin D, take more vitamin D, which then raises their calcium relative to their magnesium, and then they feel worse. Right. Until they decide that, you know, maybe they find me on the internet because I'm out there talking about don't take vitamin D supplements, and then they come to me saying, you're the only one saying I shouldn't be on vitamin D and that it's making me worse, and that's exactly what's happening. And I go, that's what I do. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, I see it all the time is clients with low vitamin D and they're pounding the D supplements, be it 50,000 IUs, multiple days per week, 100,000 IUs once a week or more, you know, and uh, I'm like, well, is it, is it improving, you know, from blood test to blood test with their, whomever they're their physician is and like, well, no, not really. It's not improving or he upped it or I'm on prescription, prescription vitamin D. And so at what point do you kind of take a step back and say, wait a minute here, what else is going on? Right. Well, what I, there's a couple studies that just came out that were very interesting, which showed that the more body fat a, a person had, the, the lower their vitamin D was and the longer it took to get them up because the body fat is a sink for the vitamin D, it, it will shove it there until it can't shove it there anymore. This is, this is how the body doesn't go so crazy with the calcium. So this is the key thing to learn about vitamin D is it, it affects calcium. That is its primary function. It raises calcium through increasing gut absorption of calcium and actually through increasing resorption of calcium from the bone. And this is in several endocrinology texts. I know everybody says vitamin D builds bone. No, vitamin D supplements actually remove calcium from bone into the blood. So they both bring calcium into the blood and then we see it go up on the hair test. So this calcium problem. So, oh, and then there was the other study that showed that African-Americans, basically the darker skin that people have naturally, the lower their natural vitamin D levels because their skin is, was designed to be in a place that they got sun all the time. And like you look at me, Scandinavian background, and I'm supposed to be, you know, I got to save up for the winter. <laughs> so we have, we have higher storage vitamin D levels. That's, oh gosh, that's a whole nother problem. We're measuring the storage vitamin D, the form of storage, not 
the active stuff, the calcitriol, basically the 1 comma 25 dihydroxy vitamins. So we're not measuring the active stuff, we're measuring the storage stuff. Doctors somewhere, researchers decided that one stood for the other, and also people don't realize that the, the active one, the real vitamin D, it costs about, I think, three or four times as much to test. So they went the cheaper one, and they said it was, a, it was a good replacement for the other one. So people can have horrible normal vitamin D levels, really bad, and they could have really high active form. And that means they're basically calcifying with esteem. Um, that's, but they only get to see that when they run that other test. So, I mean, I, gosh, I'm kind of all over the place. On no, this you, no, it's, it's perfect. It's good. And I, I wasn't going to get into vitamin D till later, but you know what, it's an important topic. And obviously, you know, it's something that you've, you've, been researching extensively and and obviously seeing the results with clients when you start to back them down on vitamin D. But so, so what are the common, uh, so you talked about like the symptoms, um, whether it be hypoglycemia or, um, you know, calcifications or thyroid issues, things like that. And the ratios between the big minerals. And so we see the ratios between calcium, magnesium and potassium and sodium and, obviously you're looking at, at, at a few other minerals. So what are the ones that you're consistently seeing that people need extra support on or that people are deficient in? We've talked about this a lot before. I mean, the biggest thing, the thing I, when people ask me like, what can I do for my kids? What can I, what could I do now? It's, it's always magnesium. Yeah. Always magnesium. Guaranteed. Like unless you ate very specific foods day in, day out, there's almost no way people are going to hit their magnesium. It's just not going to happen. And then if people, because of past health problems, if they've got a compromised gut, they may not absorb very much of the magnesium they're taking in pills. And so they don't get it anyway, or they'll take, they have such a sensitive gut. They take one pill and they're in the bathroom for a while, you right. know? So magnesium is something, I mean, I hit it, I hit it pretty hard. We've got, we've got fixes. If, if people have trouble taking magnesium, we've got, we use some cell salts. If people, generally I make people use a topical. Well, I don't make them, I suggest to them, right? I tell them I want you to use a topical. Um, topical magnesium, which can be baths, foot soaks. We have two different spray options. One is like alcohol-based that absorbs really well, and one is water-based. We have a lotion where they can make their own lotion, buy a lotion, and then we get into the pills. And then the pills, I mean, there's all sorts of them out there. There's only a couple that I don't like people to use, um, like magnesium citrate and magnesium oxide. They just don't get in very well. Citrate actually, citrate effect, copper. Citrate tends to lower copper levels, so we don't want to use that too much. But magnesium is just a guarantee. I mean, it's just a guaranteed deficiency. Yeah, I feel like I feel like people are coming around with the understanding that magnesium is one of those minerals that and especially because there's practitioners, you know, like you and me that are, are really preaching it pretty strongly. And there's lots of big strength guys that are preaching it. And so we're, we're pretty solid understanding that magnesium is one of those deficiencies. But, and, and I think that um, conventional medicine, if you will, is coming around. But I don't think there's clarity as to the forms of magnesium that are actually beneficial. An example being uh, my mom was on you know, we were talking, she, she's had kind of ongoing health stuff and, you know, here and there, and she's asking my opinion. And then of course, not listening to what I have to say, but, you know, she was on, I was suggesting, you know, maybe she needs to take magnesium. I believe it's because she was getting muscle cramps hmm. at night. I think she was getting muscle cramps and <clears throat> to say nothing of the fact that she wasn't drinking any water, but second to that is um, she's getting muscle cramps. So I suggested magnesium and she said, I think she brought it up with their doctor. The doctor said, Oh, it sounds like a good idea. Here's a prescription of magnesium oxide. Yeah. 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 Which for people that don't know magnesium oxide, it's a very poorly absorbed form of magnesium. And, uh, and so that's also a correlation that people make, Oh, I've tried magnesium, but it just gives me diarrhea, you know? And so could you just speak to the different forms and what are the forms that are the most readily absorbable, the most bioavailable, if you will? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I can go by my experience. So yeah, magnesium oxide, 
I've seen research saying it's, it's the, the bioavailability is okay, but I just haven't seen it in my clients. And when you have something that's totally absorbed with magnesium, either when, when a person doesn't get along with a certain chelate or when it's poorly absorbed, they tend to very quickly get diarrhea. That's, that's the thing you can know is if you're not absorbing it and you take a small dose, what happens is the magnesium just sits in your gut. It eventually pulls water to it. And then the body just says, let's get rid of this. And then you get the diarrhea. So actually this is a, this is a tip that people could use. What I tell people to do is, you know, you can slowly increase your magnesium, you know, one pill a day or whatever, whichever type you're taking. And when you hit that, if people don't know, when you take too much oral magnesium for your body of whatever type, you're going to eventually get diarrhea, right? It's going to happen. Um, when you're going up and you hit that threshold dose for you know, the bathroom dose, what's going to happen is about a half hour, an hour after you take it, you're going to get a lot of gurgling in your stomach and you're going to know that the bathroom time is going to be coming soon. So you can be prepared. You know, when the gurgling yeah. starts, it's going to be time to go. So I've seen magnesiums like I've seen magnesium glycinate where people go up to 10 pills a day and they're still like, when, how many should I take? Because the bottle's going to be gone in like 18 days. You know, it's going to be. And I, that kind of confused me for a second. I think I figured out. I, I just, for some reason, magnesium glycinate. I, I, gosh. I like glycinate. It didn't, on the hair test, it did not work as well as I wanted it to. Um, I know people who have gotten good levels of it, taking a lot of pills a day. Um, glycinate, the nice thing about it is you can take it as a powder. So it's, and it's, so that's, that's a good thing. So, Magnesium orotate, I used that for a good long while on my hair tests. I didn't see people respond on the magnesium on their hair tests. Magnesium citrate, gosh, natural calm, that kind of stuff. I saw it just ruin people's guts. Over <laughs> yeah. Yes. They would start at a tablespoon a day, and then over time, that, that worked for a while, and they felt a little better. And after a while, they'd have to continually lower their dose, lower their dose, lower their dose, till it was like, I'm taking a quarter teaspoon a day and that's all I can take or else I get diarrhea. Right. Like that's not a good sign. That's eventually when I got away from the natural calm. Um, there's some other types like the, the we've talked about the, glycin, the glycinate, lysinate. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen much research. I haven't used it yet. Um, what I've been using a lot now is magnesium malate. I'm finding that that's really showing up on hair tests and people are feeling better. Yeah. And, at the doses I use, I don't tend to see too many, um, I don't hear about bowel issues with the doses I use. And so that's what I'm after. When I see the hair test re respond, I see the person's symptoms respond, and then they're not getting side effects, right? That's, <laughs> that's what we're always after. Um, people ask me about magnesium three and eight, and they talk about it getting through the blood brain barrier. I say, well, if you've ever taken magnesium and you felt more relaxed for it and from it in general, I'm sure the magnesium is crossing the blood brain barrier because if you, your brain needed magnesium and it only got it from three and eight, well, you'd be dead by now, right? <laughs> so, uh, so topical magnesium chloride, that's my favorite. That just, that's great stuff. Whatever form, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate, this is the part that, that confuses people. Some people do great on Epsom salts, topically, bath, whatever. Some people like myself with the sulfur in it, they don't get along with that. And mm -hmm. so just know if somebody has you doing Epsom salt baths and you don't feel good after it, don't do it. <laughs> this is true of any supplement. I don't care whether your naturopathic gave it to you or your MD or anybody, your shaman, whatever. If you take it and you feel like crap, don't take it. Um, that's, you have to listen to your body first. And I always tell people, like, if you don't feel good on something I give you, you're to contact me and tell me what made you not feel good, how you felt when you took it. Because just like blood tests can give me further insight on a hair test, how people feel on things can tell me hidden things that are going on in their system. If, if they take a supplement that looked low on the hair test and they didn't feel good, we have, we have more data. We have, we have real world data now. So, those are the, those are the big magnesiums or anything else I didn't cover. No, man, that's, that's great. And, and, um, I think that's really valuable information for people to understand about the different forms of magnesium. And that's something we've been talking about a long time because we're working on, you know, we're just putting the, the finishing touches on our next, uh, our next product, which is going to be a, a, a magnesium that hopefully is, uh, very well absorbed and, and, 
you know, I mean, that's the thing is people need to be taking something that is benefiting them, but also identify. And that's what I respect so much about you is, is identifying when and if something doesn't, which we lose sight of often. And, and so I guess that can be something that we can segue into, but you know, so often as practitioners, like, yes, we want to get to the root cause and yes, we are, uh, a more alternative minded. And so we want people taking natural right. supplements, of course, in, instead of medications. But with that said is a lot of supplement formulations on the market have so many things in them that for any two people, it may not be like, it's impossible to say you need to take this multivitamin multimineral when simply what we're talking about is saying, well, people have so many different imbalances and ratios of magnesium and potassium and calcium and, and sodium. And, and so to make a recommendation of like this multivitamin works great, that can't possibly be the case, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I have a thing about multivitamins, which is, so first of all, there's a reason they call it a multivitamin. Right? and not a multi-mineral, because minerals are big. Yeah. Minerals don't fit into vitamins. I mean, when people are taking four magnesium pills a day just to get their magnesium, exactly. they're not going to get that in a one a day, right? <laughs> and then my, the other thing I tend to say about multis is they, if there's something in that multi that you really need, that you're really deficient in, a multi is not going to have enough to help you. Then on the other side, if there's something in that multi that you don't need because you already have too much of it, then it's going to be enough to push you even more in the wrong direction. So nobody wears one size fits all shoes. Like why would they take a one size fits all vitamin? Um, and then when you look at the garbage on the market, like Centrum and it's got like sugar, it, I mean, on the label, it's got sugar, it's got food colorings, it's got, you know, propylene glycol and other, it's just, you can't there's no need to take these things. You know, I mean, I, what I want to do, if I ever make my own supplement line, there's a couple of them out there that say they're additive free. And that's really where I'd like to go because I don't like when people take even one of mine where I try to find stuff that doesn't have a bunch of additives and then they have a reaction and we think it's to one of the additives. Right. You know, and then I, I always like to have a couple of options of like different chelates because I've had people feel good on zinc glycinate and not feel good on zinc picolinate. And so all of a sudden the chelate matters. And the cool thing about looking at it that way is we can chelates like, like uh, if one was using magnesium tori, then you get the benefit of the taurine and the magnesium. So if we can, we can get two birds with one stone, that's great. Somebody else may be in a situation where the taurine like really amps them up and they can't sleep. So they need a different chelate. So right. kind of looking at symptoms and the presentation and when we get their history and they say, oh my gosh, I took that supplement and that was awful i felt terrible then we then we don't do that so but multis are just you know this is one of the reasons i moved away from the whole hair the typical hair mineral analysis approach which was so the lab would tell you what to take the lab would send the practitioner a list they're like take these six things and take this many pills at a.m p.m lunch whatever and they were always big combo supplements at minimum two ingredients but sometimes like eight so if you have somebody, I deal with a lot of sensitive people. I deal with a lot of people who are kind of the, the failures of other doctors because the other doctors almost like fired the patient because they're too sensitive and they can't take their normal supplement. So I get them and I thought if somebody's taking an eight ingredient supplement and they react to the fourth ingredient and they can't take that supplement and I want them to have the other seven ingredients in there, how am I going to get them that? I'm going to have to give them all, I'm going to have to get all eight ingredients, have them try all of them and then figure it out. Yeah. What I decided to do was just to give individual supplements at the start. So I don't, if somebody notices, they're like, when I take that one, I don't feel good. We take that out. And that's the other thing. I don't ever get mad at somebody for reacting negatively to what I do. I don't understand why practitioners do. It's like they're insulted or offended that people didn't feel good on what they gave them. I'm just like, okay, your body said no, so we don't do that. We see we find something else, or maybe they don't need it. I've, I've seen people who seem to be super efficient with magnesium. Like they need very little magnesium, and their magnesium will still be. I mean, I'm not magnesium. I mean zinc. Sorry, zinc. Their zinc will still be high, 
And there's a funny thing, zinc correlates to smell. Your sense of taste, your sense of smell, right? They have the zinc right. taste, right? So being that taste is not smell, these people with naturally high zinc, I always ask them, are you really sensitive? Like are you like nose wise, smell wise, are you super sensitive? And they'll almost always say yes. So that efficiency with the zinc seems to carry over into their sense of smell. So yeah, those multis, man. Ugh. But the whole, I don't like mixed supplements just because if, or, or if maybe you needed all eight ingredients for two months and then all of a sudden you only need six ingredients. Well, how do we take those other ones out? You can't unless you change the whole approach. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of the mixed supplements. Cool. So yeah, it's cool. So, okay. So, so magnesium is huge. I, I think you said potassium. For yeah, my potassium we want to try to get from food. We really like I'm I give I actually in my treatment plans, I mean there's there's two pages devoted to potassium. <laughs> and my first line of it is don't be lazy with potassium. That's where everybody messes up. Potassium um, from food, the, the correlate getting the amount of potassium people get in their food correlates to mortality, it correlates, correlates to cardiovascular disease, which indirectly correlates to thyroid function. Um, it's tough. I mean, you're supposed to get, the Institute of Medicine says adults are supposed to get 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. People have no idea how much that is, right? You'll, you'll have clients, I'm sure, and I have people who are like, I eat a banana a day, I get my potassium. And you're like, cool. Um, a banana is 500 milligrams. You need to eat nine more or eight more of those today. Totally. To four, right? And, or an avocado is 1,100. Okay. I have days where I'll have two bananas and an avocado at breakfast, right? I'm at 2,100. <laughs> yep. I'm not even halfway there, and I've had three of the highest potassium foods that I can have. So, yeah, I devote like two pages to it. I, I'm moving away from pills on that because I like to use a potassium chloride of powder and that people can, you know, they, they do a mixture of a salt, sodium and potassium chloride. Basically, I call it 50-50 salt, and they add that to their food. The recipe is not as simple as just mixing those two, though I add some cream of tartar. Um, and then I have them add it to, if they need more, if they're not able to get it from food and they add it to a little bit of juice. And so they just drink that because it's hard to drink salt water. <laughs> um, but yeah, potassium is, I tell people like that day, your energy can respond to the potassium. Your, your brain fog can respond to the potassium in a positive way. Your anxiety can respond to the potassium in a positive way. If people are getting, I always ask them foot or foot or toe cramps at night almost guaranteed potassium deficiency. Mm -hmm. um, crashing, this is the weird one. So when people crash between meals, so it's like the two to 4 p.m. kind of crash, right? Where they, they've just gone, their body has gone too long for them without eating. That tends to be magnesium deficiency. That's that type of blood sugar instability. When people eat a normal meal and then they crash soon afterwards, like within a half hour afterwards, that's potassium deficiency. And so we can kind of tell even by blood, the type of blood sugar instability, which one is more likely for them. And almost everybody's deficient in magnesium and potassium. Um, potassium you can get from foods though. Yeah. Magnesium's just so hard to, because not all the magnesium foods match up with the potassium foods. And so you can't kind of intertwine them. And so potassium supplements can be a little tricky. Potassium from foods is like guaranteed yeah, that's something we see. I'm glad you brought that up because that's something we see in a lot of electrolyte drinks, especially crappy ones on the market like Gatorade is, it, you know, our, our, our potassium, our daily potassium needs are significantly higher than what our sodium needs are. And yet a lot of these drinks are so high in sodium. It's, it's junk. I mean, and to say nothing of all the artificial sweeteners and, and dyes and everything, other chemicals like that. So um, I, I really liked the 50-50 salt idea that you had when, when I did my hair mineral analysis testing with you. And it's something I felt really good about, of course, just easily adding it to all of my food. And then, of course, my, my whole family as well is, you know, to make sure that they're getting their needs. Yeah. Because, I mean, I always tell people, like, nobody, nobody's ever, un unless people, you know, go too far, nobody's going to eat too many fruits and vegetables, right? You don't have too many clients who are like, you're eating too many fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> Just asshole trainers are saying you're eating too much fruit. 
Right. right. And yeah, you're not going to lose weight if you eat too much fruit because it's sugar. And I'm like, no, that's not it. The sugar Fructose, was bro. <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go there. I'm in the best shape of my life and I'm eating more fruit than I ever have ever. So like uh, the carb. Okay. The carb okay. So, so you run the hair mineral analysis, you identify these imbalances, these ratios of minerals, you create an individualized supplement plan for people. How long do they stay on the supplement plan, assuming they're diligent? Um, so how long do they stay before you retest them? Okay. So, well, just, just to say something to the supplement thing, because we've talked about, you know, like I don't, I don't want to consider the supplement, but because of what we've done to the, the environment, the, the food, the, the toxicity, it's just food, is, is pretty tough to rely on these days. And, and, and most people don't want to, if you told them like, you have these foods every day to get these things within a month, right? They'd be so sick of those foods. They never want to touch them again. You lose those tools. So what I do is I do give people options on if there's a good food option, like for boron, five prunes a day, you can five or more, you can pull off your boron needs. You know, the problem with prunes, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've you heard. have too many. And you got the magnesium problem. You're running to the bathroom again. I know that five prunes is my dose. Like if I go to six, not good, but five is, five is my dose. But if people can have more than that, they can have more than that. So we try to work on, I, I do give people food suggestions. I'm not like, I don't want to say, I mean, I'm very into nutrition, but I don't give people meal plans. I don't give, I don't, I, that's, people have to figure out their nutrition on their own. I don't, I'm not prescribing them. You eat this for breakfast, you eat this for lunch, you eat this for dinner. But I will give people dietary stuff, whether it's to get certain nutrients or to avoid certain things. Um, but I'm not super restrictive. And then, so we do the supplement program. We like to do ret retesting of the hair. So you can think of when we retest is how long I want them to take to do the program. Right. Six months is when we do the retest. Somewhere in there. When people are first starting out, we get, we get the best results, you know, three to four months so we can tweak it sooner because things are changing faster. As they get more stable, you know, like three, four, five, six tests, then we can start pushing it out more towards the five, six month range, which is nice because it lowers their cost. Um, but that's that's the kind of retesting schedule that we go by. Cool. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, to be fair, is if someone comes to you for weight loss, as in it's like, you know, my weight won't budge. I think it's a thyroid issue, but you talk to them about their nutrition and obviously they're shoveling in far too many calories. I mean, you're obviously addressing that as a, a major player in the, in the weight loss game. I, I, I kind of give them, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, if you want to call it, I'm more of like a teach a person to fish yeah. so that they can do it on their own. I, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I will have people actually, usually what I start with, Honestly, is I have people calculate their protein grams and their potassium milligrams in a day because seriously, I mean, you've had people like this, I'm sure, where they're they're like, yeah, I I, I eat protein, I have an egg a day. Totally. That's six grams. Like the World Health Organization is like, <laughs> is like protein malnutrition, <laughs> and so you go, you got to get more protein. So I I try to. I'm trying to help people, you know, I mean, with, with weight loss, I, I used to do the weight loss game where that was like one of the major things in my practice. And I just, that personally for me was not as fulfilling as helping people to regain their health. So I'm kind of always like things shift around as we're doing it. And, and um, the weight loss is, is easier once your health is back, right? People who aren't healthy and they can't, they, they're too tired to exercise or everything hurts or everything's stiff and cracking and popping, that's calcium. But until they get that, as they get better, then they can exercise more and then everything works better and the potassium's there, which helps the thyroid function. And all of a sudden they feel warmer, they're losing weight and everything can happen. So I'm actually thinking about as, as the practice builds up more, I'm, I got this idea of getting somebody who's good with better with nutrition in terms of personal counseling on nutrition, habit change. I'm just, you, you're big on that, right? So the, the things about habit change and all that stuff, I was thinking about getting somebody to work more with people on that yeah. in my programs, because that's just something, you know, we all have what we're interested in and talking about daily diets is not my thing. 
that's I like to, I like to fix these minerals and get down to that. But yeah, if somebody has weight loss, and I'll I mean I have I actually get a lot of people who are kind of ex hardcore keto, the ex hardcore vegan, the ex hardcore paleo, and they actually caused most. The funny thing was was they were in decent health when they started, right? And then they became a health nut in their various chosen approach, and then they ruined their health. Then I'm helping them to get that back. So I'm kind of trying to not be too restrictive, give them options and like see what you feel best on. Because I know I know my diet now. Some people look at the way I eat and they go, "That's you can't eat that way." And I go, "Okay, so I'm doing stuff at 41 that I wasn't doing at 20, and I'm leaner than I was now, and I feel good, and everything's going good. So why are you going to tell me that? Because I don't have protein every time I eat that I'm somehow breaking." The rules, you know, so anyway, that's just, I tell people, I, they, people always want my diet. They say, what do you eat? Tell me what to eat. What do you eat? And I go, you're coming to me to fix your health, right? So their health is in a different spot than mine. The things I can get away with now are very different than what other people can get away with. I have people, they're like, they have to, they have to eat six times a day or they crash bad. Right. I don't have to do that anymore. When you get your calcium magnesium ratio right, and you get your, so calcium is good, magnesium is good, and the ratio is good. You know, instead of that getting hangry, what happens when people go too long without eating? They just get hungry. That's all. Yep. And this is coming from a guy, I was horribly hypoglycemic when I started. Horribly, like two to three hours, I'd be just nasty. And now I don't have that. Now sometimes I kind of go, oh, it's just hunger. Is, is it okay if I go a bit longer? Sure, it's okay if I go a bit longer not a big deal. Um, or can I, can I easily wait a bit longer to get good food versus having to eat crap at the moment? Yeah. You know? so. Yeah. So by, you know, I think it's a good approach. I mean, look, you're, you're optimizing cellular health and thereby improving every other mechanism. So it's going to make it, you know, it's going to make it easier to lose weight in the grand scheme of things. And it's something you don't even necessarily need to or want to focus on. And I fully respect that. So, okay. So, um, they undergo the program, they do the retesting. You obviously tweak every time that they retest. So what would you, what, what are the typical things that you see? Like, what does someone come up to you and say at each reassessment or as they progress and advance in the program, what are the things that people say about the hair mineral analysis in terms of their symptoms and health and things like that? This is actually something I go over with people at the very start. Okay. I'm, my main interest, my main goal is getting them better. I don't, I mean, I want to see the hair test move and I want to see it change, but I always ask them the question, would you rather feel great and have a crazy looking hair test or would you rather feel like crap and have a perfect hair test? Because I've, I've had very sick people, their first hair test looks really good. I tell people their first hair test is the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Like we don't know what's under the surface. We start nudging the system and all of a sudden things, I, I've had a guy do two, two iron dumps, probably got iron overload in his liver. It took five tests to get there. And then all of a sudden his iron went through the roof. It just happened. It happened a second time now. And I'm going, wow, this is, this is like the most iron I've seen dump out of a person. So the first test can be misleading in that it looks really good. Some people come to me, they got health problems. Their, their first test looks terrible. And I warn people that your second test, you may, I, the only goal is for you to feel better. The second test can sometimes look worse than the first yet they feel better. So I don't look at the hair test as an indicator of how they're doing. I get that out of their mouth. I, I want to hear it from them. But I, I explained, you know, the, when the body dumps, think of it, when the body's dumping, if, if it got what it needed to dump some toxic metals out of the cells, those toxic metals have to go through the blood, right? Cell to the blood, to the excretory mechanisms. So that means for that period of time in the bloodstream, there's going to be a trend towards those, those toxic metals going higher, right? And then we see those go up on the hair test because the body's dumping them through the pee, the poop, the sweat, and the hair. 
that's when we see sometimes what I call a detox explosion. You know those old equalizers where the lights would jump up and down, yeah. you know? So if you think of the hair test with these bars going up and down, when we have a detox explosion, it's like all of a sudden the, a lot of the bars just jump up. And it's a global thing. Some of those bars are going up because it's the good, the body's using or losing the good minerals to compensate. And some of them are actual detox minerals. When that detox explosion happens, I tell them what we're gonna see on the next test, we're gonna see all this settle down. It's gonna, if it's spiked up, it's gonna come right back down. And it does. So, geez, I, I, wish, I wish it were that easy. So I, I, I think a lot of practitioners don't like the hair test. Because one, it requires you to think about the complexities of the human body and how all these minerals interact. And the other is that it doesn't give you a direct indicator of how the person's feeling. So that's, that's, that makes it complicated. You, you, you have to be confident in telling people, how do you feel? Do you feel better? And if they're like, oh yeah, this is better, this is better. This problem's still here. Okay, well, two things are better. Third thing's still there. Oh, we're doing good. What, what the hair test is showing. And that's one thing that I think I'm good at. And I, I'm just, I'm really confident in what I do because I've just seen enough of them now. And, and sometimes I'll tell people, we don't get to know, like if all of a sudden a certain mineral, like a, like tin, let's say tin all of a sudden spikes up on one test. It's the only thing that really spiked up. Okay. That tin is either from you're getting exposed to more tin or you're dumping it. By the next test, we have to do one more test to see what happens. If it was a dump, the next test, it will crash back down. If you are constantly being exposed to it, and I have them go look through potential exposure sources, the known potential exposure sources, because I, I can't go through all the exposure sources of everything with them. So we go over the stuff that's obvious. They go and look for it. If they can't figure out anything, we get the next hair test back, it crashes down. We know that it wasn't a problem. If we get the next hair test back and it's still high, then we say we have an exposure problem and we need to figure this out. So like my, my Tucson people, and probably if I had, you know, if I had more Phoenix people with this pattern on, like uranium is really high in Arizona water. So we always see uranium high on a hair test because not only are we exposed to it in the water, but we'll get contamination of the hair from like shower water. Mm -hmm. Minerals, just like calcium leaves scale on fixtures like faucets and right. that stuff. Minerals that are that dry, water that dries in the hair that has minerals in it can leave a mineral scale in the hair. The cool thing is, is we'll see on that uranium over time is we'll see the uranium generally come down quite a bit. So the combination of what was in the hair between the contamination and what was internal to the body comes down. So we, we have to, this, the key thing for any practitioner on any test is to know what the test is able to tell you and then to know the limitations of the test and what it cannot tell you. And once you're comfortable with that and, and the ego is willing to be like, okay, we don't know everything. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Then you can use a test, but that also requires somebody who's confident enough to say, I don't know to a, to a client. Say, it could be this, it could be this, but I'm not sure. So we got to wait. Yeah. So that's kind of my approach. That's good. It's, it's awesome. So, okay. So we'll wrap it up here, but I want to, but just to clarify. So I, I imagine that the majority of people that are diligent with the program and consistent with following up, you know, three, six months, 12 months, I imagine that, you know, they sleeping better, have more energy, maybe losing weight easier, more mental clarity. Is all that relevant? I mean, is that? Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's fun. Almost all of those things are thyroid, right? <laughs> so, yeah, as long as if they're doing the program, I mean, I have, I, like, I'm going to answer an email from somebody after this who said they know they're not being as diligent with the potassium as they need to be. They, they know it. And so, and what are they saying? I still have some dry skin, which is a thyroid problem. I still have some energy problems, which is a thyroid. Thyroid is calcium, potassium, right? So I get to tell them, we got to hit that potassium harder. You know, but yeah, we, over time, as people do these things, I mean, obviously 
just like with training and progress in the gym, life happens. And there's things that are out of the person's control. There's things that are out of my control. So, I mean, with anything, there's, there's good and bad. But, yeah, we're, I, I wouldn't have built up the practice I have unless I was helping people. That's really the way I look at it. So, um, and then people, you know, I just I have, a, I have a really good time in my job being a, a nutrition detective. So well, you're, yeah, you're obviously, well, you're good at it. And, and you're also very passionate about it. Um, which I said, like I said, I, I very much respect. Um, and you're not overly dogmatic about your approach. And as we see so frequently in the industry, as you, you know, you've said it, you're, you're open to learning and you know that you're, you're, you're more than open to changing your ways if you find a way that you think is going to be better for your patient. And, and I think that's really cool and really respectable. So with that said, uh, where do people find you, Dr. Garrett? So I have uh, my website is dr. Garrett Smith, two R's, two T's, and I got dot com. Um, I'm down here in Tucson. We're uh, we're on Facebook. You can find me under Dr. Garrett Smith or my own name, Garrett Smith, or Naturopathic Medicine of Southern Arizona. And then our phone number down here is five two zero five seven seven six eight eight eight. Good number. <laughs> Perfect. And, yeah. So, um, Dr. Garrett Smith dot com. I suggest people follow Dr. Garrett through Facebook. He is constantly posting gems of nutritional advice, research. I, I, in fact, I'm consistently saving his posts into a folder so that, because they're like in depth, but so that I can go back and read them and try and comprehend them because as you can well see, his, his level of knowledge is, is vast. And so um, sometimes I have to take a yeah. The, the gems on my Facebook. So if, if they if they go if they go to my personal page, just Garrett Smith, and I've got so it's me with my boy. We're like standing with Captain America at Disneyland. So if they're they're looking for which Garrett Smith it is, Tucson, okay. Arizona, we're standing. We're taking a picture with Captain America. Um, the notes section of my personal page. If you don't know what Facebook notes are? They're great. It's like a way to find posts. Like so so that it's like posts are almost like pinned. And so you can always find it. You don't have to look through the timeline, but the notes are where like the gold is, is put on my personal page. There's no notes on the business page. It's all my personal page is where I put them. Perfect. That's where to find it. <laughs> cool, brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. And uh, we'll have to follow up and we'll of course do this again and, and get a little more depth into specific supplementation and, and all that. And detoxification, I want to touch on heavy metals. Um, I want to get deeper into thyroid. And, um, and so I think this was as deep as this was, it really is just skimming the surface of what your knowledge is capable of. So uh, appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon. Absolutely. It was great being here. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.